Ian, when, when you do look back over what it must be nearly 15 years now of, uh, of Jethro Tull, is there one period that you find the best in nostalgic terms, or is this still the best, most productive part of, of Jethro Tull's history? Well, it's not quite 15 years, but nearly. Well, we're um, going back to about 69 or something, aren't we? Uh, yeah, so 13, six, certainly. 60, 68, I think yeah. we started there. Yeah. It's 14 years now. Well, yeah. I said nearly. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I'm not much of a one for nostalgia. I've never kept any photographs of me looking younger or, uh, you know, any records or anything. I just don't have anything at all to do with the band other than whatever we're working on at the moment. I'm I must interject one thing. On the front cover of You Can All Join In, that compilation LP that was put together <laughs> yeah. by Ireland, you, you look exactly the same as you do now, which is quite astounding. Well, you have to remember that when we, when we first, the first album we had, which was called This Was, with amazing foresight, because uh, I intended that the album should be seen as the band's first album yeah. and therefore would probably not be representative of what we did later, I hoped, and was right. So on that album, we were all made up to look like old men. And that confused particularly the Americans, because back then in the days before our record company were our record company, as it were, when we were on a deal with Ireland, and we said, or I said, I don't want the name of the band on the album cover, I just want the photograph. And this was unheard of, you know, not to have in the top right-hand corner the name of the band. And um, it totally confused the American public. And they actually thought we were a, a band with no name and who dressed as, you know, we were actually old men. And this lasted, I think, for two or three years in America, that they really thought we were a bunch of really old guys until they saw us and they realized that, that they were absolutely were right yeah. <laughs> but i can remember you know the my sort of early days in america you know meeting as as one did sort of the kids who came up and sort of you know asked you where you were from what you did and all the rest of it and perhaps the third question they asked you after what sign are you and you know whatever they, they would say um how old are you and i said well, how do you think and they said 38 39 and that really upset me, you know, because I was, touching 20, 18 I was 20 or 21 yeah. or something, and they really yeah. thought I was that old. So, I mean, I'm still younger than they thought I was then, so everything's okay. But you're still not nostalgic about those old days, you know? Not really, because I must admit that the difficulties of touring and, and also concerts were, not in Britain, but in a lot of other countries in the world, there were a lot of problems, a lot of aggravation between the forces of law and order <laughs> and the forces of youth and I felt you know like really caught up in the middle of all this and you know if kids got broken heads or carted off to jail and all the rest of it I did feel not responsible but just felt maybe what I was doing as a catalyst for this was, was wrong in some way so there were a lot of periods when I really felt like getting out of it like really every tour from about 69 till about 74 or something when it started to, to calm down and we started to be kind of more accepted as a concert band and we weren't the latest fashionable thing anymore. It was, you know, we were already an old band then and uh, settling down into a, having a bit of control over the concerts and the way that tours were organised and, and to make it comfortable. You know, we've never taken suites of hotels or hired luxury jets to travel around in, but we live comfortably and well and peacefully mm. on the road because the only important thing is the couple of hours you're on stage. True. Here's a, a bit of a sort of Red Indian beat on another track from the Broadsword and the Beast. This is actually the Broadsword.
That's the broadsword. It says in here, in the lyrics, um, bring me my broadsword and my cross of gold and you're fighting for the motherland. What, what's that all about? Well, the song is a sort of tongue-in-cheek, sort of, you know, the man standing up for the, well, you know, the, the family. Bit, yeah, it's all yeah. that kind of thing. But, I mean, I, I defy anyone to say they don't sort of feel, at least anyone who's a family man of any sort. I mean, it's like, you know, the women and children, you know, get behind me and I'll take on the, you know, whoever the... Uh, the aggressor is, you see. There's a protective instinct coming out in that sort of tongue-in-cheek sort of macho stance of the archetypal rock star, which of course I'm not, but I, I still have a little play act on stage. So that's what it's about, but it doesn't really mean, you know, I mean, I'm not going to attack anybody with a sword, you know, unless they jump on the stage in the middle of the song. <laughs> that song is immediately followed on the LP by perhaps the prettiest tune, Pussy Willow, which is, it is a pretty song. Mm. Yeah, it's quite a good... I like that one, yes. It e nice echoes one. of um, Cat Stevens, actually, in, in the feel, which is odd, because Paul Samuel Smith producing. I wonder whether that was his influence or, or what, you know, the piano and... No, actually, I don't think Paul... I can't remember whether he had a lot to do with that one or not. It was one that... Um, I really can't remember, to tell you the truth. But, I mean, the, the thing is that, you know, I, I've only known Paul Samuel Smith's work from Cat Stevens, who I, mean, I did enjoy. But anyway, Paul has done that. I never knew the guy except for his reputation with the Yardbirds when I was a schoolboy. And um, it's very difficult to assess what his, what his um, actual relationship with the group was. Looking back on it, I can't remember him actually saying very much, and <laughs> nor can I remember playing very much, so we must have had a great time. <laughs> why but, did uh, you ask him in? Why, why did you bring him in to Because no, nobody else would do it. You know? oh, I mean, come on, you used to do it yourself, in. Oh, yeah. Of course I did, but that was because George Martin said, you can do it, lad, back in 1971 or something, and that was, the, that was when I made Aquila. Mm. And so I believed him for a few years, but I, I don't really want to think of myself as a record producer. I mean, I'd just much rather just play the music and have somebody else, you know, cope with the problem of trying to make the music accessible, trying to restrain it or shape it in the way that gives it a, a commercially viable kind of form, mm -hmm. because that's a very conscious and deliberate thing to do. And I find it very difficult uh, to separate the sort of fun of playing and the joy of being able to play what you want or do it the way you want and still have to think, are other people really going to like it this way, or do I have to mm. bend it to suit what I imagine other people's tastes are? So it's nicer to have somebody else doing that, and we have been looking for a producer really for quite a long time, but really couldn't find anyone who either wanted to do it or who was the right sort of background to do it, because we're not a, an out-and-out -out rock and roll band, and, and we're not an MOR kind of ballad or whatever group. I mean, it's, Voyager it's or odd, something. Yeah. Yes, mm. I mean, it, Jethro tells us a sort of odd kind of anachronism, strange strange band, you know, very, very eclectic, and, you know, it takes someone... Well, it takes one of, I think, a very few people, you know, who would be able to look at what Jethro Tull's done, sift through it, and, and be able to analyse what the, the good things about it were, and then utilise that in a positive way with new material. So, I mean, we had a couple of false starts, because all the good guys are booked up a year ahead, you see, you know, all ground to a halt just before Christmas, by which time we'd booked the tours and the album release date and everything and uh, we got just before christmas we got out the phone book and we made a just a list of half a dozen people on the back of uh, uh, a table napkin from the indian restaurant next door to my studio and went back into the, the studio and started it was in the evening and just started ringing and the first one that we rang was paul samuel smith who i think jerry conway had sort of thrown into the the list of a few people that we happened to, to think of and the theory being that it was christmas and probably they'd be on holiday they wouldn't be working therefore we could try and twist somebody's arm to come and you know work on the album because we had all the material about 20 songs we're going to play one now i thought you'd want to butt in we're, we're going to butt in here's here's the track that i think paul samuel smith's influence really does come through on this is pussy willow <laughs> In 
Willow from the Broadsword and the Beast. That's the music of Jethro Tull. Here's one from Jimmy Buffett, and I think he's got the right idea. I got the direction. Now everybody get in the car. Bring your money into your affections. We're going down to the shipwreck bar. All shrimp are in season. The crowd is in full swing. Moonlit night so pleasing. Makes everybody sing, sing about a happy hour, happy hour, happy time, happy time, happy nights, yours and mine, happy hour, happy hour, happy year, happy year, happy time, and Miller beer. When it's time to relax, one beer stands clear. Yeah, for a happy hour, happy hour, happy time, happy time, Miller's got the beer. Oh yeah, for a happy hour, happy time. Miller's got the Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee. Over here, you can observe the various means of transportation used by our forefathers. They had Imagine yourself touring a museum 200 years in the future. What is this interesting looking device? That was a motorbike. Motorbike? It was called the Honda Urban Express. The Honda Urban Express. How unusual. Yes, it was considered quite stylish. Stylish? Stylish. It was designed for great comfort. Notice the higher handlebars and the plush seat. Ah. Was superior design the reason for its popularity? No, it was fun. Fun? Fun. And it got up to 100 miles to the gallon. Gallons of what? We don't know. The Honda Urban Express. See it at your Honda dealer. It's fun. 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 Mileage based on EPA type tests for city riding. Your mileage may vary. Jethro Tull's popularity in America is still greater than anywhere else in the world. And the album The Broadsword and the Beast has been hailed as the band's best since Aqualung. Well, so they're saying on American radio, yes. But um, 
Of course, American Way is a bit different because they've... Uh, they go very much on the audience reaction to radio. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. they actually really do all this kind of market did, research. Did they like heavy horses they... over there? Well, I said moderately so, yes. Mm. I mean, because it's... I think that was your classic album. I, I really loved that LP. Mm. It, had a, it was a bit sort of bitty, though. Something's a, it was a kind of it's slightly too dark, the textures. I felt it, retrospectively, it was just a little bit too dark as an album. It didn't quite have that... Didn't have enough flippancy about it, really. I've never ever ha found you satisfied with anything you've recorded. Every well, time I've interviewed you, you're always kind of nitpicking about it. Yeah, you, well, so? that's what it's all about. Yeah. yeah. But you, then, no, I was just going to say, music has, you know, I mean, if you write a song, it has two lives. One when you record it, which is a very intensely personal and private sort of, you know, for the group's ears only mm. kind of experience. And then you sort of put that to bed, and then it kind of gets reincarnated as a, as a stage performance which is a whole new thing altogether. And, and just being at that point with these songs now on the new album, it's, uh, it's interesting because they're starting to, to, to shape up into the ones that really are good and the yeah. ones that you're you know, maybe a little bit unsure about that, as you just said, I would nitpick in regard to. And um, that's, that's part of the secondary sort of life of a song. This mm. is an interesting thing. Now, mm. of course, the ones we've been playing for years and years, which have really have proven themselves. And you still play them, do you? Yeah, well, not just to us, but to the audience as well, obviously. Yeah. They... I mean, did you, do you still do Living in the Past and things like that in live shows? We've never actually played that live, no, funnily enough. Never done it live. But it never really worked as a stage song for some reason. It was just, mm. uh, I don't know. I used the word flippant early, and perhaps that's the ultimate in flippancy. It was just too cute. Bit too much up there, Too yes. cute for concerts, yeah. you know. When you look to the future for Jethro Tull, is the current lineup with Martin, Dave, Jerry, and Peter is that um, going to be around for a while? Do you think now? Well, I mean, I would obviously like to say yes. I, I, the nucleus of the band really was intended to be uh, Martin and Dave Pegg and myself, <coughs> and uh, Peter and, and Jerry have sort of come in for this album, mm. and, and I guess we'll see how things develop. But are we going to see those headlines us? again in the Melody Maker? You know. Well, I would. I mean, I would hope not, because I, you know, would much rather have a band that's a permanent and stable unit. Mm. Uh, but I'm sort of used to being the, the front man in the band, and uh, in a sense, because people sort of talk to me rather than talk to the others in interview terms and all the rest of it, I sometimes feel trapped. You know, it's almost as if I do want to change somebody in the band or mm. somebody leaves or whatever, that it creates a big fuss. But, you know. Surely I should be allowed to do that if they want me to be the front man or the, the focal point, mm. then, uh, you know, you can't have it both ways. So I shouldn't apologise about people coming and going, because they always have. It's just Martin and myself have been in it, sort of, you know, really from the, the mm. beginning of its uh, successful period, so... But I hope there aren't changes. I don't like it. It's very unstable. Mm. All right, let's uh, finish off this thing with a track called Seal Driver from the album. Any story behind this one? Seal Drive was really just one of those spontaneous things. I was thinking of buying a boat at the time and thinking what I would call it and thinking about the relationship I might have with my boat uh, and, uh, and thinking of the similarities between a boat, which we always refer to as she, and a woman and thinking really there's quite a sort of sexual parallel between the two. And um, that's, I suppose, what the song is. Although I never discover these things until I read them at the end and realise what I've written, which is part of the fun of writing songs. It's, just, it's like having a, you know, a shaving mirror, but keeping your beard on all the time, you know. I'll think about that, yeah. Ian. <laughs> Me too, I'll think about it. That's just what I was saying. Having said it, now I'll think about it and tell you what it means next time we talk. Good one. Ian, thank you very much indeed. Take you away.
Could you fancy me as a pirate boat? Or a long ship biking warrior with the old guns on his side? Well, I'm a ninja man, and I'm nobody's hero. But I'll make you tight for a windy night and a dark ride. Let me take Jethro Tull and Seal Driver from their album The Broadsword and the Beast, winding up this Rock Hour special with Ian Anderson. The BBC Rock Hour special has been brought to you by Miller High Life. If you've got the time, we've got the beer. I'm Richard Skinner in London. Join me again soon for more top names from the British music scene, right here on the BBC Rock Hour. <laughs>